Our first case to be argued is People v. Alan Norcutt. Uh, ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honors. Good evening, Your Honors. Opposing counsel, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Brian Deaver, and I represent the great state of New York uh, in this matter. I'd like to jump to something that um, opposing counsel brought up. Uh, she likes, or she um, made the point that um, because there was no element of permanence um, in the residence, uh, in this case versus where in People v. Fox, she said there was an element of permanence in the homeless structure. Um, uh, opposing counsel would like to make the point that that is, um, it's relevant in this case where it's, it's honestly not. Uh, People v. Fox found that a homeless structure with two fences, two clotheslines, um, was enough to warrant a finding of a building. But that um, wasn't going anywhere. That structure, those homeless people put together, that's where they were going to be. It wasn't, didn't have wheels on it, couldn't get moved around. Uh, that's, that was where they were going to live. That's correct, Here, this trailer, it, it could have been moved at any time. Um, dude, that's correct that the structure in Fox couldn't have been moved, but we, or the, um, the trailer couldn't have been moved either. There was no engine, uh, no means of propulsion. Uh, while it had wheels, it had no way of getting anywhere unless it was pulled somewhere. Well, what if it had been a trailer that, uh, like a Winnebago, with with the section where the, the with the steering wheel and the, and the engine? Um, if somebody burned that down, would that be an arson? Yes, it would, because then you'd have to go back to the um, the penal law definition, which includes uh, vehicles that are used for overnight lodging and um, or by persons carrying on business there. And the, the statute- and it includes motor vehicles. That's correct. But you didn't use a motor vehicle theory here, right? No, Your Honor. So it's it didn't fit a motor vehicle. No, Your Honor. It, it constitutes a structure under the, the penal law definition. So, well, were there any cases that you found where a court has held that a, a trailer, that like the trailer here that doesn't isn't self-propelled, was a building? No, Your Honor. This is an issue of first impression in terms of the trailer. They found uh, there were other cases that talked about uh, uh, robberies, um, in vehicles that were being that were used for carrying on uh, business, I believe one was a trailer that was being used for Walmart, and they they robbed the uh, defendant robbed it, and um, they so found you, that to constitute all right, building but, under the So definition. you're conceding that for us to find for you, we do have to uh, go on new grounds. I would believe so, Your Honor. But okay. I think that there's overwhelming factors that prove that this is a building. Uh, okay. When you take People v. Fox and couple that with People v. Richburg, which stated that empty, abandoned structure can constitute a building. And I believe the court in that uh, situation stated that uh, we, we have to find it's a building because there's so many buildings, I forget what the city was, um, in the city that were once used for habitation that are no longer used for habitation. If we didn't classify buildings that have once been used for habitation that are no longer being used for habitation as buildings, half the city could get burned down and none of them would be arsons. But in Richburg, the court found that it was a building, and I quote, mainly because it was permanently attached to the ground. This trailer wasn't permanently attached to the ground, was it? No, Your Honor, but it couldn't have been moved unless it was pulled. So in a way, it was permanently fixed to the ground, even though it had wheels, I, not in the literal sense, but in the... the um, the actual sense it could it couldn't have been moved unless it was moved by something else it couldn't move itself isn't and the I, nature of a, tra a trailer a movable object isn't that what a trailer is an the, object that is utilized for moving things uh yes your honor in the in the traditional sense so but, we should ignore the nature of the structure in and of itself because it was a trailer right then a typical trailer with an engine with functional wheels that is used for the purposes of a trailer yes but the trailer in this situation was not. The trailer in this situation was had been fixated to that location since well before the defendant lived in. But all you would have to do is pull up a, a truck with a trailer hitch and put it on and leave. You can't, you couldn't pull up a truck with a trailer hitch and pull my house out from its foundation. Well, your house would constitute a building, wouldn't it? And the trailer wouldn't because you could move it. Isn't that the difference? You could move the trailer. That is one of the lesser factors. The, the primary focus here is, is the law. And the penal law says that a, a building that cons it's ordinary meaning, which is a structure with walls and a roof, which in this situation, the trailer has a wall and a walls and a roof um, and is used for overnight lodging. The defendant himself lived there for three to four months. So all these other factors, yes, they contribute to it. Um, but the, in, when looking at the statute, they're truly irrelevant. Well, doesn't the penal law distinguish between a, the in a fixed building, right? It you, does. Did, you did not charge on a, on a vehicle. We did not. No, it, okay. we we classified it as a structure. Right. So when we so. so when we when you didn't charge 
charge it as a vehicle, then we can't look at something that could be moved like a vehicle, That's such correct. as a trailer. We have to look at as it a as building. a structure that cannot be moved except by uh, ulterior or outside means um, that uh, was fixated to this location, whether it was fixated by cement or fixated in actuality. Um, and it fits the penal law definition. It was used for overnight lodging. And under its traditional definition, it was a structure with walls and a roof. In People v. Fox, they found a structure that did only had two walls that were fences and clotheslines to constitute a building. And then you couple that with People v. Richburg, and you find that an, a building that used to be used for overnight lodging that has the indicia of a building is a building. What about counsel's argument that the building, your version of a building, wasn't being used um, to live in at the time of the arson? It was being used as storage. Does that matter? I think it's irrelevant, Your Honor. Um, or we, uh, we think it's irrelevant, Your Honor. Uh, in, when you couple Fox with Richburg, Richburg never made one of the primary factors um, whether or not it was. Can you repeat yourself one more time? I, I forgot what you said. <laughs> Does it matter that the, the trailer wasn't being used as a residence or as a place oh. to sleep or a place to cook food? Is that relevant? It wasn't being used that way at the time of the fire. It was being used as storage. No, Your Honor. But the, um, the purpose of the statute was to promote safety of human individuals. The fact that the defendant had lived there previously. But that's the point. He lived there previously. There was no one living in it when it was packed to the gills as a storage facility at the time of the arson. So if the policy argument is that the statute should protect people in their homes, that doesn't really fly, does it? Not in the sense that you're speaking of, but when you couple it with Richburg, which says that any building that was once lived in has to, or any structure that was once lived in and was used for residential purposes, we can't just assume that because it's no longer currently being used for residential purposes that there's still not a threat to human life. It still shouldn't be classified as a building. It the should. buildings in the case that you're referring to, were they burned out structures that used to be houses? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, Your Honor. Or were they trailers that had wheels and could be moved? This had no forms of propulsion, so I believe they're one of the same in terms of the definition of the building under Penal Law 150. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to jump to uh, the weight of the evidence argument that the defense makes. Um, Before you do that, I sure. just had a question about why didn't the trial judge take five minutes and talk to the juror with the newspaper and not leave us in the dark about whether there was a, a problem there? Your question answers itself. Uh, he didn't. He didn't stop and um, conduct an inquiry because the defense counsel raised it the, the day after. Um, the judge looked at uh, the situation and realized that the, there was no evidence that the jurors knew that uh, any of the members of the courtroom were the firemen that the defense counsel raised as being uh, part of that, the, two, the first part of that objection. Well, I, I think I'd agree said. with you that it's a stretch to think that the jurors made the connection between the people in the courtroom and the people mentioned in the story, although they might have. Okay. But let's say the, the uh, attorney had brought it up the, the day before, because uh, I think the attorney didn't know that the story, didn't know about the story until the next day, and she put it together. Okay. So as soon as she put it together, she brought it to the judge's attention. But let's say she had put it together the day before, and before uh, anything went any further, she said, could you please just do a in-camera discussion with that juror so we just make sure we don't have a problem? What's wrong with that? Well, the, the trial court judge stated himself that by conducting an inquiry into a matter which only the defense counsel observed, there was no other evidence that there was actually a newspaper there. There was no evidence that the juror read that newspaper, and there was no evidence that that newspaper talked about the trial, which was the curative instructions to the jurors, which was don't look up or uh, observe or listen to any news about this trial. So there's no evidence to suggest that. Yeah, but couldn't the judge have handled it in the following way? I, we noticed that you had a newspaper with you. You remember I instructed you, just, just the one juror, not the, all the jurors. Okay. I, I remember I instructed you not, not to read the newspapers uh, uh, during this case. Uh, have, have you seen any, anything? Have you read that newspaper? Is there anything in it about our case? Have you, and, and leave it alone at that. Wouldn't that frustrate the very purpose of the curative instructions? And I believe that's what the trial court judge argued. Was that um, didn't the trial court judge basically concede it probably would have been the better practice to uh, to ask the juror whether he'd read the newspaper? I don't believe so, Your Honor. There there was no evidence to suggest that, that there was no evidence to suggest that the newspaper was even there. Uh, I, I believe the judge essentially said that there was overwhelming uh, circumstantial evidence that the defendant committed this crime, and that the newspaper being there was something that the the 
defense counsel raised on the last day of trial once the def- well the, we, uh, we can't find on this record that defense counsel made this up right no your honor okay um, if I could move back to point three uh, of the the uh, appellant's brief, uh, which argues that the weight of the evidence did not support a finding of his conviction. And they argue three specific points, the third of which I've already addressed with the uh, the building not being defined as a trailer. Uh, so for the first one, their first primary argument under the weight of the evidence is that no arson was committed as causation was never established. However, if you look at the record um, from 174 to 177, when Lieutenant Galloway was on uh, the stand, he in his professional experience, determined that the fire could not have been caused by any other source but human involvement, which eliminates any possibility, as the defense counsel raises, that the batteries or, or empty gas tanks that were inside the trailer could have started the fire. They were just accelerants. You need a flame to start a fire. Can't, the accelerant can't just light itself. So there was a causation established based on the, pro, the professional training of Lieutenant Galloway. And on the second point, that he was not the individual at the start of the fire, he being the defendant, um, there's overwhelming sub- circumstantial evidence based on the testimony of uh, Chiscanic, uh, the man who observed him outside of Murphy's Tavern. He uh, observed him at 11 in the morning while he was outside uh, after having a beer, correct? One beer, Your Honor, yes. Yes, and he didn't see him go in the trailer? He did not. He, he observed didn't the see man his wearing... face? No, Your Honor. So how is that overwhelming evidence? That by itself is not overwhelming, but when you couple it with the rest of the evidence, um, he observed a man wearing a black tank top, carrying a yellow and black, yellow and blue, excuse me, gas can, walk around the back of the trailer towards the defendant's residence. Um, he only had one beer that night, so or one one beer that morning, excuse me. So the defense counsel's uh, assertion that he uh, was impaired in any ways is, is just ludicrous. Um, then when you couple that with Lichen statements, where the defendant approached him a week later. Um, and said, this is my gas can, I gave it to you, remember? And my fingerprints are on it. And he admitted all that to, to his neighbor, his upstairs res- uh, neighbor who lived above him. Um, he gave conflicting stories to Lieutenant Galloway and Detective McBlain. Uh, to Galloway, he said that he was um, in his residence, had not, not gone outside that morning. Um, and to, to McBlain, about uh, two months later, he stated, I was walking home from 313 Liberty Street and I observed the fire and I called 911. Um, that kind of flip-flopping on his story is, is prime indicia of, of guilt. And then when you couple that with the fact that um, he admitted to both McBlain and to uh, Galloway that he had some, uh, some animosity towards the trailer under Cartner, uh, he admitted that twice, one to each of them. Uh, that's, you know, that right there establishes motive. So you have a man with a gas, with who's wearing what the defendant was found to be wearing shortly after the incident, carrying a yellow and blue gas can, uh, which was later found at like um, next to Lycan's, um residence, which the defendant admitted to owning, admitting to possessing, um, which is an accelerant, which contained an accelerant, which was you know typical of lighting fires. Why was there no evidence of an accelerant in the fire then? W- wasn't the issue from the investigator that he couldn't find an accelerant? Here, yes, all you're t- discussing is evidence of an accelerant, which the detective didn't find. Correct. He did not find an accelerant. But in his professional training and expertise, he posited two possibilities for why there was no accelerant. He said it might have burned off when the fire was started uh, or that when the fire department came to extinguish the fire, uh, it washed away. So if he couldn't find an accelerant, then it's speculation that the, the accelerant in that blue can started that fire. Okay. Uh, we were not we were not classified as speculation, Your Honor. Um, based on Galloway's professional training, um, in and I believe on the record at one seventy six, he states that um, in a lot of cases where there are arsons, the accelerant typically isn't found because it burns up or is washed away, and he, those are the two uh, possibilities that he established for being. But he didn't establish that the the accelerant that was located in the blue and yellow can was the accelerant utilized in this fire. Is that he, correct? He did not. Although okay. the fact that it was by the scene of the crime moments before the fire started and was later found by the defendant who matched the description of the man who was carrying the tin while he walked around the back of the trailer towards his residence, it's it's all collective as evidence, which is enough weight of the evidence for a jury to determine that it was the defendant who, who started the fire. And in People v. Bleakley, Deference must be given to the jurors. Is that true? 
don't don't we have the authority essentially to sit as the 13th juror when we're determining the weight of the evidence and to determine whether an acquittal acquittal would not have been unreasonable based on the evidence you do your honor although deference must must should be given to the jurors uh, and based on the overwhelming circumstantial evidence that it put the put a man matching the defendant's description carrying an accelerant which he later admitted to having in his possession uh, he had conflicting stories about where he was, where he was, what he was doing, and he established that he didn't like the guy whose trailer was on fire. Mm-hmm. All, all of that overwhelming circumstantial evidence should lead this this court to find that, um, as the lower court did, that uh, the jurors properly ruled in this case. Uh, all right, I believe we have your your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian, you did a nice job coming back to your strong points. Uh, you got beat up a little bit on the building stuff, and that's, you know, frankly, one of those questions that could, could go either way, and there are pluses and minuses on both sides. But you kept beating the totality of the circumstantial evidence, which, you know, when when in doubt, play your strong suit, and, and you did that well. So that was, you know, I, I think uh, we may have had you on the ropes a little bit with the, with the first round of questioning, but you came back strong and, and focused, uh, focused on what was strong about your case. Uh, Rachel, you. Brian, I thought you did a, you did a good job. You, seem, you seemed a bit nervous, but you had everything really down pat. I think you really hammered home your points and the, the power of the circumstantial case here, which this is a strong circumstantial case for the, for the prosecution. And I think you brought that, uh, that across very strongly in, the, in your argument. Um, <clears throat> uh, I thought that you were forceful. Uh, you, you, uh, when you got tripped up, you on a question and you didn't hear a question and you started answering it before you really heard the question, you stopped yourself, composed yourself and asked the judge to repeat the question, which I think was showed a lot of good composure. So I thought that your argument was excellent also. And I think you did a very good job. Right. 